It is 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Before we start, I'm going to make sure that the YouTube channel is receiving the content. As always, got to make sure everything is good to go. It looks like it's receiving content. Awesome. We're going to give it a few minutes before we start. Going to give it a few minutes before we start. <laughs> awesome sauce. All right, all right, all right, all right. It looks like we are live in the YouTube channel. Excellent. We're going to give it one more minute. It is 3.01. We're going to start at 3.02. Such a beautiful day. For those individuals that are tuning in, thank you so much for stopping by, supporting. And again, we're going to start in one minute. We are uh, broadcasting today in YouTube, as always, and also Facebook Live. Great, 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 great. <laughs> All right. So go get a cup of coffee. Go get a snack, some fruit, whatever you need to do to munch on to enjoy the show uh we got one more minute 302 it is 302 so let's start all right guys welcome 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 to the server room episode 23 holy moly 23 episodes holy crap that's a lot so today is all about the lenovo system x 3650 m5 server which i did an unboxing slash first impressions of the machine uh, once I had the machine behind the scenes and I started playing around with it, I just fell in love with it. What an amazing machine. So today we're going to be doing a review, a quick review, right? Just a bunch of features, the processing speed and all that good stuff. And then we're going to do a configuration. Okay. So I want to give a big thanks out. I want to be, I want to give a big shout out to all of you guys, all the subscribers out there out in the world uh that tune in every saturday i appreciate you guys thank you so much uh as always if you have the power to leave a comment leave a comment let me know how you're doing what's your name if you're new to the channel make sure you subscribe uh make sure you you know say hi at the, the super chat or you know the chat section and uh you know let me know where you're from if you're new if you're not new hi what's up thank you for coming uh give a big thumbs up and uh let's start so also, I want to give a big thanks to Lenovo for uh, hooking us up with the, T with the TD340. That's the primary machine that we've been using throughout the entire show. Plus, they also sent me this uh, System X3650 M5. So I definitely want to give them a big shout out for that. Thank you so much, Lenovo. All right. So let me switch real quick. A couple announcements before we like fully, fully start. <laughs> and... Uh, so one of the announcements is new uh, notes, new location is going to be at this particular uh, link. Uh, I'm going to stop placing individual links for each show. Plus my videos, my other videos on my channel, I'm going to stop placing different links. So rather than you going to the video and clicking on the link, just go into this specific repository and all the notes and everything are going to be there just one centralized location for you guys to make everything easy. Now today's PowerPoint and notes are going to be placed after the show, right? Because I want you guys to stay tuned, right? <laughs> uh, so don't worry about that. Then uh, the last announcement is uh, the server room episode 24. We're going to be dealing with deploy iOS app within SCCM uh, integrated with Intune. A uh, couple of shows we've done so far uh, dealing with this. I want to take advantage and push out as much as possible with you guys. I want to push out a lot of information to you guys as much as possible because my Intune trial base is gonna going to expire. So I want to show you guys how to deploy iOS app with SCCM to your mobile devices that you're managing within SCCM and Intune. Plus, I want to deal with Android, how to hook up your Android devices to that, plus deploy Android apps as well. So pretty soon with that. Now, uh, this is going to be broadcast on September 23. That means next week's uh, Saturday, which I think is the 16th, um, the server room will not happen. So I'm going to take a day off uh, to rest, spend some time with my son, 
plus gather my thoughts and create more videos and more shows for you guys. So I do apologize for that, but next Saturday, no server room, okay? So uh, we are just, before I even start, I want to I want to show you guys something. So let me put this on full. All right, put that on full. Ah, get out of here. Okay, cool. So before we even start, because I want to show you guys something. Let me do something real quick. Give me one second. Dun, 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 dun. Just doing something real quick. Give me one second, guys. Just give me one second. I want to do this. Look at that. That's the sexy machine. So I'm going to start the machine right now. I want to boot it up live. Yeah. So we're booting it up. We're booting it live. So it's look at that. It's a beast right now is doing the system initialization, uh, initializing the memory. So I just want I just want to show you guys that it is a real machine is not a virtual machine. The way that I'm going to log into the machine is through remote uh, desktop. Now, the machine already has the operating system uh, on it. And the reason why it's on it is because. I didn't want to waste you guys time like the process of deploying an operating system is like watching um, paint dry on the wall. You guys don't come here to waste your time. So I already deployed the operating system already on this guy using SCCM. I want to show you guys the steps that I did within SCCM to deploy 2016. I even capture a little clip about a minute, 20 seconds of me. Uh, showing you guys the whole deployment process. So rather than waiting 20, 25, 30 minutes for the deployment process to start, I did everything behind the scenes to make life easy for us. Okay. All right. So let's get into somewhat the boring part of this. So some of the key features of the X3650 M5. Now this guy offers numerous features to boot, uh, to boost performance, improve scalability, and reduce costs. Now this guy is a powerhouse for virtualization. If if I ever had the budget to my nine to five job. I would definitely get the X3650 M5 for just a virtualization machine. It is awesome. And this is the reason why we're configuring it with Hyper-V today with a little PowerShell. So we're not really going to be using Server Manager to install Hyper-V and do all that stuff. We're going to use PowerShell because I know a couple of you guys said, oh, how about you do a little PowerShell? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little, I'm going to squeeze in a little PowerShell for you guys and do that. Uh, again, the notes are going to be provided of everything that I'm doing today, so do not worry about that. Now, this guy actually offers the Intel Xeon processor E52600 V4. Okay, this basically includes up to 22 cores of processors, 55 megabytes of L3 cache, up to 2400 megahertz of memory speed. Now, this is the cool thing: it's up to 9.6 giga transfers per second with QPI interconnect links. Okay, now Q, QPI, which is this is new to me because I'm not really into the Lenovo server world. So I'm super happy that Lenovo sent me this device to do a review on and to play around with it because I've learned so much. And a lot of you have also given your feedback because you have Lenovo servers in your infrastructure and giving you actually giving me tips and tell me like, no, oh, this this is what this does. And I'm learning. So QPI is a, a quick path interconnect. And that basically used uh, uses um, used to access all remote memory or multi socket systems. So it takes advantage of all the memory uh, within you know multi socket systems because this particular server has two processors. It's awesome. It's super fast. Uh, it supports up to two processors, right? 44 cores and 88 threads. I mean, it's a monster. So I'm gonna go back into here. Look at that. So you guys probably see my hand. Hello. All right. So I'm going to log in right now. All right. So I just logged in right now. You guys saw me uh, again at the, towards the end of the video uh, or at, towards the end of the show. I'll probably just uh, answer all your questions and stuff. OK, so. Uh, it is also equipped with Intel Turbo Boost technology that allows CPU cores to run at its maximum speed. Uh, and it goes beyond the TDP, which is the thermal design power, which is awesome. 
a uh, couple more features it has hyper threading very 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 important when you're dealing with uh, virtualization uh, it does come with the intel virtualization technology uh, up to 1.5 terabytes of memory now this particular model that lenovo sent me has about 128 gigs of memory huh, it's crazy now it's 16 gig uh, sticks and total of 128 i don't recall what type of uh, memory sticks there are you are able to use either dims or lr dims but you but you're not able to intermix between those two so it's either dims or lr dims now it also has 12 gigabit per second sas internal storage you can actually do sata and you could do sas now this particular model that Lenovo sent me has two solid state drives. Uh, I couldn't really play around with the RAID system because, come on, two solid state drives. The, the best that I could do is a RAID 0, RAID 1. So what I did was I just left it as is. I used uh, slot 0 to be the primary operating system and slot 1 would be my D drive. And the D drive is where I'm going to be storing my uh, virtual machines. Now, it's a solid state drive, so I still have that, that read and write speed, which is good. Now, up to 250, uh, 215 terabytes of storage capacity. Holy moly. That's a lot. To me, that's a lot. Uh, I know there's a couple of servers in the market that goes beyond that, but 250 terabytes, 215 terabytes of storage capacity, that's amazing. Now, that's with 7.68 terabytes of 2.5 solid state drives. What? Crazy. Now, this is actually a 2U rack uh, form factor server couple more it has four integrated gigabit ethernet ports and then one of them is actually the imm management port yeah i think yeah uh, it has eight pci express expansion slots plus one dedicated pcie 3.0 slot for an external storage controller it has the built-in integrated management module which is the iim i think one of you guys left them uh, a note on my unboxing slash first impressions and you kind of kind of kind of knocked my head and said no the iam is like the drake within the dell system which is awesome i started playing around with it uh when you you could change the ip address or you could use the built-in ip address for the iam for the integrated management module which i think the default is 192 168 70 125 and then the username is user id and then the password is password with the o as zero right so all that stuff is within the lenovo site but i make sure if you do use the integrated management module just change the pass change the password and the username create another username change the password for the default stuff and then change the ip address to either access it from your wham or from the lan okay uh again the integrated management module monitors the system trigger alerts performs recovery actions in case of a failure great thing to have i would definitely definitely take advantage of this particular port if i had this within my nine to five job now it also has a built-in diagnostics using dsa which is pre-booted it's a it's it's a nice little feature that allows you to troubleshoot issues with your server uh, so that's a good thing to have and now the x3650 m5 comes in different versions front part i don't know why but the this is the front part this is how it looks so if I show you guys real quick, this is this right here. If you look at the little mini, little mini guy right here in the bottom, this is how it looks. Now you can actually get it in different flavors. Um, what do I mean? Like right here, this entire row right here, you could get all SAS or SATA uh, dry bays, or you could have like a nice L uh, LED display, or have like three uh, USB ports here. Uh, this particular model that they sent me does not have the VGA port. Again, it's optional, which is okay. But on the back side, this is how it looks. You got the eight uh, PCIe slots. And then you have a VGA. And then you have the Ethernet right here, which is also your um, integrated management module. And then you have your four one gigabit ports. And then as always, I do recommend... I've, I've dealt with consultants um, that when you go in, they're pretty cheap. They try to save money and they don't want to get like a second power supply i always recommend get a second power supply okay i've had the worst case scenario that the sql database was running on one power supply and one hap and what happened it died 
It died because the power supply died and we didn't have a backup. So that's not a good thing to have. Not, you know, it's, it's really bad. So make sure you have two power supplies. Make sure they're healthy. Make sure they hot swap. And, you know, just make sure you got two power supplies. That's one of the things I could definitely tell you, right? Uh, next thing, this is the inside. When I open this guy up, it's really easy to open. Uh, it's not that bad. It's uh, a nice little latch system on it. And just looking at it, I fell in love. I, I love looking inside servers and computers. It's all this green and kind of chips and all that stuff is it's just beautiful. Uh, right here in the corner, you have your riser slot. Uh, got a couple. This right here is your storage controller. I think this storage controller is the M52 10 or the 2515 i'm not too sure this is on your memory slots the two processors are right here uh you have your four uh hot swap fans so that's cool 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 uh so the processor so again this goes up to two processors of the intel xeon processor e5 2600 v4 series now this product family is up to 22 cores Clock speed of the processor is about 2.4 gigahertz, which is not that bad. You could probably go inside BIOS and clock it, you know, you know, clock it a little higher, maybe to 3.0. Uh, yep, up to 3.5 gigahertz core speeds with four cores. Uh, two QPI links up to 9.6 uh, giga transfers per second each. That's each, each processor. Holy moly. Uh, up to five, uh, up to 55 megabytes cache. And now this is the E5 2600 V4 series. And for memory, up to 24 megahertz of memory speed. Now, up to two processors, you can actually get it hooked up with the Intel Xeon E5 2600 uh, V3, which I'm assuming is a little cheaper when you're, when you're kind of co configuring the server on the site to get it. And this one only goes up to 14 cores, but the clock speed is up to 2.6 gigahertz, which is not that bad. Uh, two QPI links up to 9.6 still. Uh, the cache, the, the, the cache is a little lower, it's only 35. Uh, and the memory speed is a little lower, only 21, um, 2133 megahertz. Now for memory. Now it has 24 DIMM slots, uh, 12 DIMMs per processor. Four memory channels per processor with three DIMMs per channel. Now it supports either RDIMMs or LR DIMMs. Uh, memory types cannot be inter intermixed, so that means you can't have 12 R DIMMs and then 12 R um, or 12 LR DIMMs. You just make sure if you start with R DIMMs, you finish off with R DIMMs. Okay, and the boost speed, the maximum speed for the memory is 2400 megahertz. Uh, with our DIMMs, you could go up to 768 gigs. That's with 24, 32 gig our DIMMs with two processors. Holy moly, 768 gigs. Crap. Now, with the RL, with the LR DIMMs, you could go higher, but it's going to cost more money. Trust me, it's going to cost a lot more money. You could go up to 1.5 terabytes with 24, 64 gigs LR DIMMs and two processors okay now storage capacity there's a huge mixture of configuration that you could do with the storage capacity with the x3650 uh, and you can this is one of the cool things you can actually intermix with sas sata and pcie drives are supported with this particular model and oops oh you guys didn't need to see that get out of here get out of here you guys can't see that's later on. That's the deployment process. Get out of here. Guys over here trying to take a sneak peek. No. <laughs> All right. So up to 155 terabytes with 14 10 terabyte 3.5 inch NL SAS or SATA hard drives. And two 7.68 terabytes uh, with 2.5 SAS solid state drive. So that's the configuration that you can actually get this guy equipped but again the more hard drives or the better hard drive system that you get like a SAS, you're definitely going to spend more money Ugh, more money uh up to 250 uh to, up to 250 terabyte 215 terabytes with 28 7.68 7.68 terabytes of 2.5 sata so with the SAS solid state drives you could get up to 250 uh 215 terabytes that's a shitload of space 
pardon my French, but that is a lot of space. You know what kind of virtualization you could do with that? Oh my God, you could just do so much. Plus with the 1.5 terabyte of memory, holy moly, my God. I could just, I'm drooling right now with, with all the stuff that you could do with this machine. It's phenomenal, awesome. You could do up to 56 terabytes with 28 2 terabyte 2.5 uh, 2 SATA hard drives. Up to 50.4 50 uh, 50 terabytes with 28 1.8 terabyte 2.5 SAS drives. Up to 30.7 terabytes with 8 3.84 terabytes. Now, NVMe PCIe solid state drives. So if you want to take advantage of the controller within the within the server you can actually use uh mvme wow i can imagine the speed on that Whew. now storage controller uh is 12 uh, gigabit sas or 6 gigabit sata uh, raid now this is really weird because it comes with it, it, the site like lenovo says it's optional to upgrade to raid 550 is available for the m1215 like okay just give us that option like i know for for dell uh depending on what controller you get you could you automatically going to get the raid 5 and raid 10 and raid whatever for this you have to pay a little bit more money to have the m1215 controller to you know so you'll be able to do the raid 5 or 50. now for optional upgrade to raid 5 or 50 is available for the m5210 i believe this particular model that we're checking out today has the m I think the M1215. And again, it's optional to upgrade to RAID 6 or 60 for the M52. And, you know, just more gibberish stuff. So it, you have different options for the storage controller. So it really depends on how you're going to get it configured or how much money you have it, you know, you have budgeted on your uh, yearly IT budget to get this machine. Now, it does have input output expansion slots. And again, it has nine slots. Now, slot four, five, and nine are fixed slots of the system, and the remaining slots uh, depends on the riser card installed. The slots are the following. So I'm just gonna put real quick. Real, there you go. So slot one, this is basically the configuration that you get. Slot two, basic configuration. Uh, this is 16 speed. Uh, slot one and six are the only two slots that could do 16 speed. The other slots only do eight speed okay again all this information is going to be provided for you uh just after the show i'm gonna i'm gonna put everything inside the the github repository so don't worry about that and the uh, slot nine is the dedicated one for the internal storage controller okay and then slot five six and eight are required for the second processor to be installed so you need that second processor to take advantage of slot five six and eight Okay, so deployment time. Yes, the fun part. Everyone loves the deployment time. So again, we I've used the deployment with SCCM, and I use the SCCM server that we have been using throughout the entire show. The one that we built together. We created a reference image. We integrated MDT. We integrated into that is the server that I use for this machine. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. This machine right here, this beautiful machine that you see my my little fingers. I'm doing my my spirit fingers. I'm gonna do my spirit fingers for you guys. <laughs> All right, so that's the, that's the machine. Okay, so the first thing that I did was super simple. Uh, if you've been following me within my D drive of my SCCM, I have a source folder, and within the source folder, I'm zooming for you guys. Uh, source folder, I have an OSD. Operating system deployment, operating system folder, and inside that operating system, I have operating system images. I created another folder called Windows Server 2016 64-bit because you know what? That's what we are deploying to this machine. Now, the manual with the X3650M5 does indicate that this machine is compatible with Server 2016. So there's a good chance, actually, I could, I could tell you off bat that you're not going to have any issues with drivers. You probably have one issue with the drivers and that's like a PCIe and you just have to locate the particular driver to inject it. Now, I didn't do any driver stuff because again, I read the manual with the X3650 
And when it said, okay, server 2016 is compatible, you shouldn't have any issues. I just shot the deployment and it worked. I was super excited. Awesome. Okay. So once you create your folder, next thing that you need to do, well, for me, because I have my SCCM server virtualized, I mounted the, I, the ISO of the data center 2016, because that's the version that I deployed this data center, because we're doing Hyper-V. It makes sense to do a Windows Server data center 2016. You want to do data center with Hyper-V, okay? So I kind of um, mounted that ISO, and you know my SCCM saw it. I clicked on it. I opened folder to view. I navigated into the root of the ISO, and I basically copied and pasted everything inside this folder, inside the folder that I created, right? The content of Windows Server 2016 needs to be copied over. Got it? Now, while this was copying, I made sure I went inside my DHCP, which is my BJ-MDT, which is my MDT server. Again, another server, another server that we built together during the show. And this server is my MDT, my WDS, my, what else? I think my W, my WSUS, I think is a lot, a lot of services. So I made sure that because I'm booting a 64 bit operating system, right? Yeah, 64 bit, this section right here, right? I made sure that it is pointing to my SCCM server. 100 is my MDT server. So I just made sure my 110, 110 is the SCCM, and then you want to change the boot file name to be boot x64 wds mgfw.efi. Okay. Now you're probably saying to yourself, Bernardo, what the hell is that? How did you do that? Again, we did a video, we did a show with this stuff already. So definitely check that show out. If you have any more, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know. I will help you out as much as I can. Okay. So I made sure my back, you know, my network was running efficiently. So when I pixie boot into the machine, I had no problems. You got to make sure everything is working. You have all the loose ends working, right? So I went back into the server. Everything was copied over into that primary uh, folder that I created. And what I did was I navigated to the UNC path. And within the UNC path, I, I copied it. Because the next thing that we need to do is go inside SCCM. You want to go inside software library. And within software library, you want to go to overview, expand operating systems, and locate operating system images. You want to right click on that and do add operating system image. Now, once you get that, you're going to get this beautiful, nice little window. And you want to copy and paste it. Now, I didn't, I forgot to paste that the full location. Now, the full location needs to be sources slash install dot win. Okay. This is what you need to point this particular uh, path to. And it, it gives you an example. So make sure you go sources install dot win. Okay. You want to hit next, give it a nice little name, a version, comment, whatever you want. It's up to you. It really depends on your, your environment and how you do things within your worker area. Uh, click on next, next and complete it. Awesome. So next thing that you want to do is you want to right click your new operating system image, go to distribute content, click on next here. You want to click on add. You want to do distribution point. And if you're probably, you're probably saying to yourself, Hey, Bernardo, how the hell, why do you have cloud and all premises? Well, all premises is the one that we've been doing all, all along. And the cloud one is the one that when we integrated our Intune, that's when this pops up. You probably have something different in your environment. Just make sure wherever you want this image to be distributed, just pick that particular DP, which would be this guy right here, my server. So I pick that, press OK, click on Next, Next, and Close. Good to go. Now, back to this window. Make sure that this guy right here, I'm going to zoom in for you guys. Make sure that this guy right here says Success 1. It's green. If it's still in progress, it takes, a, it takes some time. Just be patient. Make sure you refresh. And then when it, it, once it's loaded, success, you're good to go. That means it's already synced to your DP. That's a good thing. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, why are you rushing? Well, I'm rushing because I don't want to waste you guys' time. I want to go straight into the server and start configuring, doing a little PowerShell and doing all that good stuff for you guys. All right? So if you think I'm going a little fast, just let me know at the chat. Let me know, hey, slow down, Bernardo. Slow a little. You know, please slow down. You're going too fast. 
But again, all this stuff is going to be provided at the end of the show. I'm going to drop it inside the GitHub repository. Um, I am looking slightly to the chat. Uh, I'm going to answer all your questions hopefully at the end of the show. Okay. So from here, uh, next thing that we need to do is create a task sequence. So still within the operating system and task sequence, we're going to right click. Uh, you could create a MDT task sequence. Really up to you. Really depends on your environment. For me, I just created a task sequence. Uh, we are going to install an existing image package. You want to give the task sequence a name, a nice to, uh, description, and a boot image. So for me, the boot image that I picked was the built-in boot image that comes in with SCCM plus when you're installing Windows ADK. Okay. Now, the Windows ADK version that I have is 14.393. Okay. So once you pick that, you hit next. Then you pick your image. You go to Browse package and this is basically the operating system image that we you know we pushed out or we you know we import it into an SCCM server so you want to pick that click on image index and you need to tell your task sequence what particular Windows version or Windows server version you want for me I picked you guessed it server data center standard which is this guy right here Okay, make sure you uncheck this really up to you, depending on your environment. I uncheck this because I'm testing it out. Uh, I don't really need to configure the task sequence to use BitLocker on the server. Plus also enable the admin and provide a password and keep that password and share it out to your IT people. Click on next. If you're joining the machine to a domain, do it that way. For me, I'm not. So I left it as work group. Uh, you want to hit browse and make sure you pick your configuration manage uh, client package. It really depends on your in your environment. You probably configured a little different, a uh, little differently in your in your side. But my cache size for my SMS is this. My um, configuration manager log max history is this, and also my log max size is that. Uh, from here, the state migration, I kind of disable that. I don't need that. Include updates. I'm not including any updates. I'm not including any applications. It's a pretty straightforward task sequence task sequence uh, again you can actually configure it to do a lot of stuff but for me i just wanted the operating system to be pushed out click on x all these green check marks is always a good thing close that and then you're going to find your, your task sequence because we need to deploy it so right click on it hit deploy and you need to browse for what collection. Now, the collection that I'm going to be pushing it out is unknown computers. Most likely you didn't get this nice little warning, just press okay. And I'm going to do all unknown computers, okay? Press okay, next on that. You need to definitely change this because you don't want it to be available only to config manager clients. That's a no-no. You don't want this operating system to be um, uh, pushed out to your machines on the floor that have SCCM clients. So click on that guy and you want to change it to only media and pixie. Very, very important. Make sure that you do that. Click on next. You can give it a schedule. I didn't do a schedule. This is only good if you are deploying it to your SCCM clients within your infrastructure. The user experience. Uh, again, I don't need this because I'm not pushing it out to SCCM clients. Alert, again, I don't need it. Uh, DP, with the DP, I left it everything as is. Summary, all green check marks is always a good thing and you're good to go. Now, the next thing that you need to do is because I did not, because I didn't, I haven't used the boot image, the, the built-in boot image within SCCM, you have to make sure that you distribute the content because when I, I thought to, I thought to, um, I thought to myself, okay, Task sequence is done. It's already distributed to the DP. I, I'm going to pixie boot. I pixie boot. I had no issues. Boom, boom, boom. It was working. I logged into my SCCM. I picked the task sequence. It was deployed. It was like, uh-uh, no, you can't. Boot image, blah, blah, blah. It gave me an error. And the reason why is because I forgot I didn't pick the boot image that we did together on a, you know, a couple shows ago. So the boot image that I picked was the one that was built in. You, you know, the one that SCCM uses when you install the Windows ADK toolkit. So I had to go inside software library, overview, operating systems, boot images, pick the boot image that you're gonna be using. For me it was 64-bit, 
And the reason why it's 64 bit, because I'm pushing out a 64 bit operating system, right? So right click on it and you want to do is distribute content. Got a nice little wizard. Click on next, click on add, distribute uh, distribution point DP, pick your server and then click next, next and close. And again, go, all, you know, one of the things that I love to tell you guys constantly is when you distribute stuff to your DP, make sure you go to the content status, refresh it until it says success one. Okay. You can always go inside the log and check it that way. But best practice is just make sure it's green. It's one good to go. Okay. And that's it. That is it. So you're probably saying to yourself, I want to see how the deployment stuff works out. So I actually captured some footage of me because the deployment took a while for me to shoot it out to the machine. And if I did it live with you guys, I know something had happened and the machine like took forever. So this is a clip of the machine, right? The machine that we're, we're on right now. And this is the machine being pixie booted. It's using the WinPE BTN0007. And I went to the back because I wanted to show you guys that that Ethernet cable is actually being traced to a, a nice little switch because that switch is attached to my ESXi server within my, one of my V switch. It's a weird setup, but it works out for me. So right, that black box right there that you just saw, that's the TD340. That's the Cisco switch. And the Cisco switch is what's connected to uh, the TD. Now, right now, it's Pixie booting. It read, it basically read 110. Remember, the server IP is 110. That's my SCCM. And it looks like it's booting. Oh, that's so sexy. Nice. Again, I think the process took about 25 to 35 minutes. Uh, but once it got to the part of pushing out the operating system it was super fast like wow super fast and i think it's because it was the solid state drives so this is again this is the operating system being applied to it and that's the the task sequence name yeah yeah that's the task sequence name and uh i think we're almost done gave you a nice little front shot and Bay zero is the only one that's blinking because that's what the you know the task sequence is deploying to bay zero. So bay one is not being being used. Nothing's happening to it yet. And then goes the operating system being deployed and loading. I was super happy for everything to work. Super excited. And right now it's getting ready. So that was the deployment stuff. Which is uh yeah, that's it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch scene. I'm going to move the mouse. All right. So you guys see the mouse, right? Good, 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 good. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is the, if you see my mouse on the lower right hand side, I'm going to close the PowerPoint. Right now you should see my ESI uh, console, which I'm going to load up real quick for you guys. So you guys see this and I'm going to bring up this, this virtual machine. And let's switch scenes again. Cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remote into that machine because I want you guys to see it. I'm going to click on connect. And let's log in to this beautiful machine. Got to make sure I write the right password. Hit enter. And right now it's saying, yes, uh, the name of the virtual machine is V Hyper dash btnht so let's click yes on that if everything goes well the screen should go black and it should lock and i'm inside the virtual machine what what awesome so let's go into this beautiful so a couple of things so let's right click on this guy i want to show you guys something because this is a monster monster let's go to performance let's go to cpu look at that beast oh man I'm like, I literally have tears in my eyes because I love this stuff. I love this server. This is awesome. Again, the memory is about 100, 128. Oh, monster, 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 monster. All right. So right now I'm going to go to start. I'm going to go to server manager. And I want to show you guys that there's no Hyper-V stuff inserted. I'm going to go inside my Fire Explorer. Um, 
I have my E drive mounted from my remote desktop because there's PowerShell. What what? PowerShell. So the PowerShell is basically all this. Again, this is notes that I'm going to be providing to you guys. I'm gonna go over everything, but uh so I'm going to just drag it and drop it in there. Let's uh go to start super fast windows powershell i'm going to open up the windows powershell ise because i like the interface and i'm going to run it as an admin great and let's open that up a little bit okay and i like to have there we go close that up awesome so I'm going to open up that uh, PowerShell file. Awesome. Okay. So I created a master, a master VHDX file. And the first commands with the notes that I'm going to provide you guys, I always do that. With the notes that I'm going to provide you guys is mount VHD. And it's going to mount the particular uh, VHD, whatever name that you provide your VHD you're going to mount it using PowerShell. Then you're going to copy the unintended um, XML file to the destination right here. The reason why is because I'm using a master VHD file to deploy my virtual machines. I'm not, I don't want to insert an ISO and then go through next, 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 next. I don't want to do that stuff. And then you, what you want to do is you want to dismount. So you probably say to yourself, Bernard, how the hell do you do an unintended XML? Well, to do that, you, you already have the tools. All you have to do is go get the files. <laughs> so I actually have a see if we could do is full. So I, I actually took these snapshots at my home server and I was I was taking advantage of my MDT uh, 843 virtual machine. So what you want to do is you want to get the whatever ISO that you're dealing what with us what we're doing today is windows server 2016 64 bit so what i did was i mounted and i copied the install.win file and then i open it up with windows system image manager when you open up this WIM image it's going to ask which WIM image you want what which windows image you want for us it's going to be the sad uh, server data center so you pick it, you press OK. It's going to give you a nice little warning. And the reason why is because uh, there hasn't been a catalog file associated to it. So it needs to create one. So once you hit yes, you're going to get this. It's going to take a sweet time. So, you know, be patient. And once it's done, what you're going to do is, um, well, this right here is me copying over the ISO stuff. So you're probably saying, where the hell do you get the install? You just go inside the the source folder that's where this install.wim file is located then once it's already mounted you're going to see it right here within the windows image it's mounted awesome and once it's mounted you want to go inside all these components it, i can't really tell you okay this is what you need to do this is what you don't need to do you need to take time to go over and make the modifications that will work within your environment for me i went inside seven which is the ob the oobe system I went i did some of that i went inside the windows pe i did a little bit of the generalized i did a little bit of customization on some of them now you're probably saying to yourself but we want to see what you did blah 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 now i'm going to provide the xml file that i do within my environment so you guys could take a look of some of the settings so don't worry about that now i highlighted on the desktop that this is the catalog file that it creates this is what pops up so i don't want you guys to freak up freak out if you see this pop up this happens um, because you know the windows system image manager needs to create this before you can start messing around with it uh once it's done once you have the xml and what you're going to do is you're going to file save as and save it and then within uh, powershell this is the master right here. I'm in the E drive with PowerShell. I ran the command to mount the master VHDX, which is mounted. So if I go back, you only see C and E. If I go back to the next slide, you're going to see that G, 
G is what's mounted for the master, the, the virtual hard disk. So from there, I made a mistake because I thought it was D. It wasn't D, it was G. So you want to do a copy item dot forward slash, actually backslash unintend dot XML destination of G, whatever, whatever letter is uh, your virtual hard disk is mounted to, just make sure you pick the right letter to Windows Partner. Okay, uh, Panther. Panther. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once it's there, what you could do, you can actually double click on this. It's you, you're able to navigate inside this drive. So I double clicked on it. I went inside Windows. I went inside that folder, and there goes the file. Okay. Next thing that you need to do is dismount the virtual hard disk. So you dismount it, and it disappears, and then you're able to do what you need to do. Again, this uh, PDF will be provided, so do not worry about it. Okay. So next thing that we need to do is we need to install the Windows feature. So like I said, if I go inside Server Manager, there's no Hyper-V installed into it. Hmm. So we need to install that. So I'm going to close this guy up. And... I like to write all my PowerShell commands on a text or a PowerShell script file and just it's easier than typing everything up. So this basically adds the Hyper-V feature and also includes the management tools and it does a restart. So you need to use the commandlet of install Windows feature, the name Hyper-V, this is going to be the role, and then you're going to include the management tools, this is the parameter and you want to shoot a restart parameter. So I'm going to just copy this guy. Actually, I don't need to copy it. I just do is run. And it's collecting the data. It's doing its thing. Once it finish, it is going to restart the machine. Awesome sauce. <laughs> I just I just glimpsed some of the some of the chat now okay so this is installing so uh, let's i want to i wanted to reboot and then i'm going to go inside the chat and chat with you guys for a bit and then we're going to continue doing that thing all right it's restarting so i'm going to switch so there it goes there goes the machine there goes my hand i don't want you guys to think this is magic and this is a virtual machine. This is not really a virtual machine. So this is a physical machine that we're using today. So that's super sweet. So while that's rebooting and installing the Windows features, let's go inside our chat. And I'm going to chat with you guys a little bit. And once that restarts, we're going to continue doing what we need to do. And uh, we have HD. He said HG. He says, I'm in. Benjamin King. Hopefully you got some coffee. Uh, we got cloud developer said subbed today after watching the Windows Server. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for subbing. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the BTNHD family. I appreciate that. We got Big R. What is up, Big R? The server is crying out for an ESX. <laughs> you don't know how bad I wanted to install an ESX install i you don't even know how bad i wanted to convert this into a, a vm work, workstation but i still have a couple more days with it so i just want to do the hyper v stuff but there's a good chance i might just wipe it clean and just install uh vmware stuff because i really want to take advantage of that now the way that i'm probably going to install the esxi stuff will i'm going to take the I'm going to take a flash drive. I'm going to install the operating system on the flash drive, have the server boot from the flash drive, and then take advantage of the storage. All right? That's a good, that's a good idea, right? We got Big R. He says, when SQL servers concern, it would be clustered or replicated. Uh, we have Cloud Developer says, just curious, why do you use VMware over Hyper-V for your lab? Um, Mm, that's kind of good good question okay so the reason why i like to use vmware is because one with vmware the way i have it set up it's rebooting i can hear it right now um the way i like to set up the vmware i like to install it inside a nice small usb 
and then take advantage of all the storage. With Hyper-V, you have to have an operating system. Now, don't get me wrong. You can install a Windows Server Data Center Core, and then you have to remote into it, which is a small little footprint. You could do it that way. I don't really favor anyone because my nine to five job, I I have both of them. I, I kind of intermix both of them. You know, I do a little bit of Hyper-V and I do a little bit of VMware. Both of them I like evenly. I can't really like decide which one is better. For me, they work well. It's just, I don't know. I, probably, uh, I bet you a lot of you guys have different opinions. So I'm gonna switch to this. It's stopping the services. Once it stops, once it stop, it's restarting right now. Okay, so there's another restart. And then hopefully we could uh, log into the machine, log in. <laughs> and then we're gonna remote into the machine. We're gonna continue. Okay, let's go back into our chatting. And we have James7466. Do you integrate Windows updates into the image? Well, because this is a lab um, and I normally just want something fast pushed out, um, I don't do it. Now, my two cents, honestly, I do not like to integrate Windows updates to the machine because... Okay, wait a minute. I'm not going to say I don't like. I only like to integrate Windows updates, only the critical ones. They're the ones that you really need to have on your image. If you're like pushing every single one of them, I don't like doing that because that means it's a lot to be pushed out. That image, that that uh, WIM image, that Windows image gets bigger. That container gets too big. And if you don't have a strong pipeline, to push it out through your network, it's just gonna be slow. You want your Windows image to be as small as possible so it can be pushed out quickly and you could do the thing. Now, if you if you just import the operating system, push out the task sequence, push out the task sequence, <laughs> push out the task sequence the way it is. If you have a WSUS, your WSUS would take care of the rest. It would do the updating for you. I just don't like I don't I don't know. It's that's my two cents. Probably I don't for those that integrate windows updates are, are there anyone out there that integrate updates to their uh deployment if you do you know let me know how how you feel about it all right so so we're gonna go back right now it's booting hopefully it boots up so it looks like it's doing its thing hopefully this will be the last boot and then we could continue all right, so back to the chat. So we have uh, never mind. Saw the software update <laughs> tab. <laughs> uh, cloud developer with a funny, crazy-looking face. He says that wiring, nice. Well, this this is just a lab. You know, this is just a lab. If if, if it was like a really land room, like a room with AC and all that stuff, it would be much cleaner. All right, uh, James, are you worried about the power bill? No, I'm not worried about the power bill. Should I be worried about the power? <laughs> I'm not really worried about the power bill. It's no concern. Uh, this is this is for you guys. Uh, HG says he also he also has almost the same configuration server suite. All right, so we're back. Looks like it's loaded up. I'm gonna log in. All right, it's logged in, awesome. So let's switch back to our scene, beautiful. Let's double click on our remote desktop. Let's connect, let's provide our password. And I'm gonna switch and I'm gonna hit enter and I'm gonna hit yes. And it should black out, it should lock. There you go. I just wanna show you guys side by side that it is happening in real life. <laughs> all right so we are going to let's uh edit i'm gonna open this guy that's okay because we shut it down it's all right so the next thing that we need to do is we installed our update so let me zoom in 
it's beautiful. We installed, uh, let's verify it. So you're gonna do a commandlet of git windows feature with a parameter of name, and it's gonna be Hyper-V. So we're gonna run this selected right here. It's gonna collect it, and most likely it's going to say install state installed. That's awesome. If you wanna double check, you wanna do it the manual way, just click on start. You wanna click on server manager, or if you pay attention to your start menu, you're gonna see within the windows admin tools, it's going to say new and then you're going to see hyper v manager so let's click on that let's click on that and there's nothing in it awesome there's nothing in it my people so we're going to minimize that and the next command is make a directory now i already have a directory within the server so if i click on my file explorer go to my d drive i created one already so it's vm uh let's delete it let's delete it let's get that out of there and let's just change that E to D and let's run this selection. Boom, done, simple. So let's go back into that section and there goes the VM, right? Now, next thing that you want to do is, I'm gonna zoom out, uh, is get, you wanna get the name of the adapter because within here, uh, within your server, we want to create, um, we need to create virtual switches. We don't have any virtual switches. So if I go inside this machine, this machine right here, and I go inside my virtual switch manager, there's nothing. So we need to create one, okay? So let's create one. And this does have uh, internet access. So if I go to start, let's do a command prompt with admin and let's ping Google. So this guy does have internet access. Beautiful, excellent. Let's exit out of there. Awesome. So what we need to do is we need to locate the name of the adapter. So let's run this particular one. Actually, let's clear the bottom. Let's run that selected. And there it goes. So we have about four. Again, we have four gigabit ones. These are all it right here. Uh, we are going to do, let's do, 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 do function zero. Let's do function zero is the one that we want to create. I think that's the one that's connected. So let's double check real quick. Again, I'm doing everything in PowerShell, but you can technically just right click on this, go to open network settings and you can see, there you go. Function zero is the one with internet access and with the net adapt, uh, get net adapt the commandlet, it just tells you function zero. So with the next, with the next uh, PowerShell script, I'm gonna change this. Let's change that to function. Uh, what is it? Where are you? Function zero. Function zero. Okay. Might have might have issues creating this, so let's select that. Yep, yep, because of that zero. So let's do something real quick. I don't know. This is weird. I don't know why they do this. So let's uh, let's delete that. There you go. Make it super simple. There you go. So now, awesome. And if I run this right here, so you're probably saying to yourself, what is this PowerShell? So this PowerShell is the following. We're, we're using the new VM switch commandlet with the parameter of name. We're giving that private. We're using the net adapter name of function, function zero. The way that you find the name is either you go inside the open um, network management or you just use get all technical and just use the get net adapter commandlet. You want to allow management to the OS and you want to set that to true. So we're going to hit run on that. It should be really quick. It's adding the virtual switch and it's almost done. Creating it. Uh, let it do its thing. There it goes. <laughs> Caught a quick glitch and the reason why is because you're messing with the primary ethernet that's connected to the internet so if everything works well if we go inside our switch and we click on our virtual switch manager booyah we have our private 
it's hooked up to the external one, it's hooked up to the switch, it has the allow management operating system to share the network adapter. Sweet. Just a nerdy way to do it. You can actually just go inside virtual the virtual switch manager and just go uh, create a virtual switch and you could do it that way but you know doing a little bit of powershell with you guys now the next thing is let's clear this out let me zoom in there's a couple ways that we could attack this now i need to make the modifications because this is actually the d this is the d <laughs> and the this is going to be called private awesome and let's call this, this is the name, let's call it YouTube for now. And we're also going to be setting that guy to processors. Because by default, when you're running or when you're creating a new VM using the new VM commandlet, it gives you one processor. So you can actually change the processor to whatever you want. I'm actually going to bump that up to uh, four. Let's give it four. So what's going to happen to the following? Now, this is a like really simple command uh it, you're, it's using the command line of new vm the attribute of name this is the name of the of the virtual machine the path the new vhd path which is going to be d vms is the folder that we created and the name of the subfolder let's change that as well and the vhd there you go so this is just creating the container you're not really installing the operating system so it's like really plain so what i'm going to do is highlight all this and i want to show you guys real quick because i don't want you guys to think there's magic there's no magic there's no virtual machines in here everything is done everything is being done live i'm gonna refresh it no virtual machines I'm going to put this to the side right real quick right here. I have all this stuff highlighted and I'm just going to run the selected and boom, it pops up YouTube. Everything is good to go. If I right click on it and I go into settings, here goes the settings. That's the hard drive right there. <laughs> it's awesome. Again, it gives you one processor. 4 gigs is what we told it to give, you know, to start with 4 gigs. Okay. And if we want to change the processor, again, you can actually go inside the settings and do it manually. But, you know, I'm, I'm a geeky person. I love to do things the hard way. So we're going to use the following uh, PowerShell script. And it's going to be set dash VM processor, the name of the, the name of the server or the virtual machine uh, with a parameter of dash count four. Remember, it was one. It's one right here because that's the default and we want to change it to four. So let's run that selected. Yep. And it's not, I got to need to close it because it needs like our little refresh, refresh them. Good. Right click, go back to settings and we have four processors. What, what? Now that's easy because that's an empty container and we, need, we still need to go inside and attach something to boot from and install the operating system. So we're going to get a little technical. So from here, so we go to D, VMs, YouTube, there goes the container. Awesome sauce. So this is the master file that I have. Let's change something real quick. And yeah, go to view and don't hide apply okay thank you all right so that's the master file that we're going to be used this right here already has server 2016 already installed and it has the the xml file already imported the only thing that i did not add with my within my xml is the password because i wanted to change it up so if we go inside the script the script that i'm going to provide you guys at the end of the show don't worry again you can modify it this script is a little bit more sophisticated because I created one, two, three, four uh, variables. One variable is called vSwitch. That's the private one, right? Uh, the VHD path, I'm gonna change that because I was because I was testing it out on another environment. Uh, what are you doing? So I need to change that because that's going to be the D. We are going to be deploying an, uh, a machine called VDC, right? Domain controller. 
and then we're going to be calling we're going to be deploying another uh, machine called the uh, file share so these these are the variables that I called it and I assigned it to this now the first one is basically a copy and paste you could do this as many times as you want so we're doing a write vibros copy the master VHDX which the VHD is this path right here actually it's not located there is actually located on the D drive and it's calling the master is making a copy of it it's once it makes a copy it's renaming it it's renaming it to the name of the new server and I'm using this variable right here I'm calling it out okay so it's gonna go to D boom and the name of the of the new server so I'm actually uh, calling this guy right here calling the new VM commandlets with the attribute of name I'm using the variable of DCV name which is this right here VDC we're doing the memory startup bytes of 8 gigs the VD path is going to be that location you can actually set it to whichever generation you want I'm doing generation 1 um, also when you create if you're creating a master virtual hard drive disk make sure that you keep in mind which generation switch you pick if it's two and you deploy one you're gonna have some issues that's what I read online so for me when I created my master virtual hard disk it was a generation one and then it's going to the switch name which was private I don't know I'm gonna put a lowercase just in case I don't think it makes a difference and then I'm setting the VM processor to count two and then it's writing again the process and it's going to start the virtual machine so I'm going to and it's a copy and paste the only thing that I did was just change the variables so this one right here is creating the file share so if I highlight this entire thing and rerun it ooh, wait a minute what and it, uh, let's do one at a time Oh, pfft, forgot my vax <laughs> I caught some errors you know why I caught an error guys you know why I caught an error because I forgot to highlight the the variables so let's highlight this entire thing right makes more sense let's erase that again there's no virtual machines there we're gonna run that now that it is running so if you look at the screen right here it's copying the master VHDX is deploying the new virtual machine with VDC eventually it's gonna pop up it's gonna take some time because it's copying over it's a pretty big master file I think it's 10 gigs and it's a pretty simple uh, virtual hard disk it's the operating system that's it so once it does the copy or it's making a copy and then renaming it it's going to start building it and it's going to create it with eight gigs cool uh, generation one and it's going to set the processor to two I should have gave it more processor come on like I, I'm being stingy uh, there's more processing speed for this machine to push out I could do like a 10 uh, the VHD is copied and is building the virtual machine so if I go back into the manager there it goes and it's starting the virtual machine if I right click and connect virtual machine is starting how gorgeous is that look at that right now it's doing the second vir virtual machine and it's copying over so if I go inside there goes awesome so I'm gonna close that up let's go back here and there it goes cool 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 right now it's building it once it finished building it it's gonna start it oh it's beautiful gorgeous look at that look at that look at that now okay starting there it goes both our virtual machines kind of sucks man I should have changed the processor to maybe a little bit more because if I go to the settings with the VDC one two should have gave it more if I go to memory eight gigs I could have gave it more too come on 128 gigs this machine has and I give I give this damn virtual machine eight gigs and two processors stupid <laughs> but it looks like it's launched it's good to go uh, it is 4 or 9. Wow, we passed. We passed the time. Uh, let's take a quick closer look on the machine. Still, It's still there. We're still logged into it. Um, yeah, man. Uh, that's it. 
so let me go back here i think this is the only thing that i forgot to do within my xml file is this part right here but let's click next here accept that this is one of the things that you could customize your xml file for me i forgot to do it shame on me but once you customize that xml file all this stuff should be seamless look how fast that's it done done i got a virtual dc up and running with no problem how awesome is that and i should have same thing should happen with the same thing should happen on the file share same thing with the file share so let's click on next on that accept that and because I forgot to configure a couple of sections within the XML file, this is the reason why I'm doing this. But it, which is okay. You know, I'm getting old, I'm forgetting things. There it goes, and that's it, done. We got two virtual machines up and running with no problem. This machine is a beast. And that's it, guys. Man, oh, this machine is amazing. Uh, I, I, got a, I got this machine for a couple more days. I got this machine for a couple more days. I'm definitely going to play around with it a little bit more. I, I might m wipe it clean and install VMware uh, and take advantage of it and just like create like clusters of craziness. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. But uh, let's go inside the chat. Answer any questions before I head out. All right. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, so we have uh, HG says, right now I have a Dell Power Edge R910. Ooh, nice server with 128 gigs and four terabyte SAS and solid state drives. Ooh, that's a sweet, sweet setup. Congrats. I'm super, super jealous of you. Uh, it has some issues for the management LAN port. Sometimes it's not showing power with 2016 data center install. So uh, do, hopefully you have all the drivers and stuff installed because sometimes that's the case. Make sure you have the latest driver. Um, Cloud Developer says, you know you can create a Hyper-V VHDX file that is your Hyper-V host and boot off of that VHDX and the rest of the storage can be used for other VMs. Yeah, I know that. Good tip. This is true. Benjamin King says I use uh, WSUS to deploy updates after the WD, uh, uh, after WDS has finished deploying the operation. Benjamin King, see me and you, me and you are cool, awesome. That's the that's the way I do it for my nine to five job as well. It's, uh, for me, I, I feel like it's much better doing it that way. Uh, we have cloud developer uh, says we absolutely integrate the updates into our gold image. Oh my God. I, I do not like that word gold image. Ooh, it reduces the deployment time by 70, 80% of time. Okay. It, you know, the gold image does work for a lot of companies, but for me to be honest with you, my deployment time for at my nine to five job takes less than eight minutes. That's pushing out the operating system, pushing out all the applications, pushing out all the drivers, pushing out all plugins and updates, and done. Done. Then the machine is logged into the network, and WSUS is doing its thing, and I monitor all the updates, and then it restarts the machines after working hours. Done. Uh, but again, a lot, of, a lot of you guys like to approach things differently, and I'm not telling you that's the wrong way or the right way. It's just whatever works within your environment okay what makes your life easy do it that's what i say right okay uh cloud developer says with hyper v you can also perform offline image updates which gives you the ability to patch your images very quickly but i haven't tried it yet this is so true very true again like i said earlier i have a mixture of vmware and hyper v and patching up even restoring Hyper-V machines is super seamless. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Uh, Tony, Tony, what's up? What's up? <laughs> what's up? What's up? What's up? Uh, but overall, guys, again, uh, I think we were successful today. I will provide all the information for you guys. I'm going to drop it inside the GitHub repository. Make sure you guys get that information. I'm going to provide the PowerPoint, the, the unintended XML process that I did, the PowerShell commands that I did as well. You can make modifications. There's also a PowerShell 
a script online that allows you to push out a domain controller with the roles and features, add it to the domain, do all that stuff. I've been playing around with that uh, PowerShell script and haven't been too successful on that one. But um, overall, guys, hopefully you guys enjoy the show. Uh, next week, the server room will not happen. I do apologize for that. Need to take some time. Uh, be a father, spend some time with my son, also take care of a couple of other things and plan for the upcoming shows and videos that I'm going to do for you guys. But the next show that we are going to uh, see each other is on the 23rd, right? 23, which is going to be dealing with SCCM and Intune and mobile management and pushing out apps to devices. So that's going to be awesome. So overall, guys, I'm hoping that you guys enjoy the video. And I catch you guys on the next live stream. If you have any comments and concerns, don't leave them at the super chat because that stuff disappears. Like seriously, it will disappear. So don't leave it there. Come back once the, sh the video is uploaded and is live on the channel. Leave a chat. I will receive an email. I'll reply back to you. Uh, if you have any requests, you could do it there. And uh, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And uh, I catch you guys on the next one. Oh, wait a minute before I go. <laughs> Big R say I agree. Big R says I agree with BTN HD. Install the operating system. Add apps as layers. Gold images are difficult to manage as you have to recapture if you wish to do changes. Well, you don't really need to recapture to make changes. Well, it really depends what kind of changes you're doing. But the majority of the time, you can actually mount that particular web image and do everything through the ADK tools to make the changes and then, you know, dismount, you know, dismount it. But it, again, I, you know, it's a pain in the butt just managing it. Ugh, don't like it. But uh, I'm out of here. I'll see you guys on the next one, right? So how do you turn this stuff off? Hmm. I think you turn it off. Hmm. Uh, uh. Nope. That didn't work. Wait a minute. That didn't work. <laughs> Wait. Wait. All right. All right. I got it.